All right. Technically only seven times. <laughs> I didn't get the the robot lady. I'm just saying. I got it. I, I don't even ask questions anymore. <laughs> Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Drew Shulman. And I'm Marie Vigourou. In this episode, we're doing a recap of Supernatural Season 7 through the theme of family. Let's get the show on the road. <sighs> All right. <Whew. laughs> How are we feeling? I, I'm, feel, I'm feeling good. Honestly, I'm feeling good. I, You know what? I think for all the shit I was prepared for with 6 and 7, mm-hmm. I'm not defending it, but it was better than I expected. I went in with incredibly low expectations, and I came out with a little bit better. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That's uh, that's saying a lot, Drew. That Do you realize <laughs> what you're saying? <laughs> Like if this, like if I, like hey, if I think like the the peak of season five was like a seven out of ten, I expected this to be like a one or a two. I would give it a three. Okay, like okay. I'm not saying oh, it was okay. stellar. I'm just saying it was less bad than I expected. All right, all right. Well, um, so as usual, uh, for our season recaps, we are going to start with a bit of a longer recap from you um we're gonna go through most of our 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 motions but for the recap you get three full minutes to do a recap of the whole season and i have to be honest with you there's a lot there's been a lot of talk in the carrying wayward server about your season recaps and folks are excited and folks have expectations <laughs> interpretive I'm dance just is saying. one day one day interpretive dance not not yet <laughs> but uh i have ideas i have things coming don't worry um, so I'm going to give you three minutes to recap all of season seven. All right. I'm going to count you down. Count me down. All right. Three, two, one. No pressure. So Cass becomes God. Despite this, he dies releasing Leviathans. Sam is having hallucinations of Lucifer and being tortured. We meet Sam's secret ex-friend, a monster who Dean decides he needs to kill. And this upsets everyone. Clearly Sam and Dean have to deal with the imposter giving them, you know, Uh, giving up their bad names and most wanted spot, meaning it's time to ditch baby and the usual code names while working with Bobby's old pal, Frank. We meet Garth and the show once again spits on fans by making Becky even worse than she already was. We learn about Leviathans planning to take over humanity via food. Bobby is killed in the process. Dean has a daughter with an Amazon who then kills another terrible choice this season. If I do say so myself, with Sam finally at his limits with Lucifer, a deus ex machina from Cass comes in to save him, whose surprise isn't dead, just, you know, amnesiac. Uh, we get Bobby back as a ghost, but learn that it's not all upsides. Big shocker. We meet Charlie, or as I'm choosing to call her, uh, I was going to say the third Winchester, but the fourth Winchester. Um, we meet Kevin, who is sucked into all this mess against his will after an uneasy temporary truce with the Alpha Vamp and some blood from him, as well as a Crowley and cast sharing of blood. They defeat Dick and Crowley's back on top, stealing Kevin. Sam's all alone, and Cass and Dean appear to be in purgatory. But of course, I need to quickly recap all the creatures they fought this season. I- I'll be honest, I need a little more prep for this one, so I got it on my phone. Shit, one second, dropped it. Give me- no, half a second, I'm so sorry. Hello. Okay, okay, so listen. They got face against their old bestie buddy and boyfriend Chaos, a kitsune that Sam has a crush on, the judgment of Osiris, in a court or a barn. Uh, do you think he passed the bar? I don't think so. Then they cast a Buffy, um, or I mean, some old married witches. Uh, not evil, but uh, we get that we get the evil Sam and the evil Dean, but they don't got goatees. Um, a ghost who hates fake psychics. Uh, Stephen King's Misery, the book, but with Becky and a crossroads demon who cheated, so Crowley does not like them. Um, uh, we get the Jersey Devil, kind of. Uh, some goofy Bobos. Bobby got a deal with the Reaper. A pair of, you know, Batanas. Gee, who would know they come in pairs? Huh? Um, Kronos, the god of time. Out of my head, that's a microphone. Um, a very poor depiction of women in Amazons. I think some writers' execs need some reflecting. Evil clowns, or you know, just clowns. Um, there's also a unicorn and some sharks. Uh, a serial killer who's a noble the demon. Some cursed objects. Dean's secret, you know, passion for ballet. Hallucinating Lucifer. Uh, Cass beats it up though. Then 
Garth, the most handsomest puppet of all time, shows up as ITV, and they fight a drunk demon of Shoujo. I guess Sam and Dean needed a little help there, too. Uh, then we get a ghost who kills another ghost, and Bobby's back! Yay! Um, the evils of communism, defeated by a badass hacker chick. Also, Leviathan's there. Uh, then Megatron's there, I think. We meet the Alpha Lamp again, and he's all campy and shit. And then we beat Dick. With just one stroke, he explodes. Grew everywhere. They get him off. The show that is. The end. Hi. You gotta back up here? One second. Did I miss anything? That was amazing. What happened? I dropped my phone and something <laughs> happened. Okay, I feel, so because we are an audio media, <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to describe what just happened for the people who are listening to this only. By the way, if you're listening to this, shut it off, go to YouTube, actually watch it because it's really, really worth it. Drew just pulled out, well, we need a name for it, um, but a it? sock puppet for him, her, they. I think they works. They works. Um, Great. I don't know. You, if anyone has an idea for what we can name this handsome sock, let me know. Mr. Drewels. Mr. Drews. Mr. Drewels. Yes. Drewels. Thank you, oh, Mr. Yes. Drewels. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna go take <laughs> down now. That was a lot. Bye, everyone. Bye, Mr. Drewels. Okay. Well, I think you know that every year you keep or like every season I know, you I just know, keep I like know. you are. <laughs> I swear, I'm gonna have to hire this an orchestra by the end of the series. Eventually. All right, wow! Uh, Thank you so much for that. Um, you may or may not have like killed me a little bit at the end. With <laughs> that's, I'll have to go back and rewatch this. I couldn't see what was happening while I was under my desk. <laughs> I died. Oh goodness! Well, thank you he's so now, much. He's now just sitting on my. They're now just sitting on my desk watching me. <laughs> Excellent. <sighs> so, how about the long game? <laughs> yeah, let's 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 have a look at that. So as we've done with our season recaps in the past, instead of the long game this week, we'll be reflecting on what we have gone through over this season, uh, podcast wise and team wise. Mary, would you like to start? I would love to. Thank you so much. Um, so okay, so it's really funny because I was reading the notes that I'd made for season six for the season six recap, right? And I was all like, oh, I can't wait to get back to a normal rhythm for season seven. Cause like we had to record so much, so fast for season six. And like, I kept like hammering that point home. And I'm literally here like almost six months later, like, oh my God, season seven just lasted forever. And like, of all the seasons to get this feeling for, season seven is probably the worst one, I think. And like, <laughs> for me anyway, I think I've made that clear. Um, but this was really the first time since we started in November, 2020, that like there were some days where I genuinely just did not want to be recording. And for context, like in the last six months, we got like season two of Our Flag Means Death, which like, okay, despite the fact that I was disappointed with the finale, like I really did enjoy watching it. It was a, a really fun process. And I also really got really <laughs> into the X-Files, um, which we all know. So there were like these other stories and this other content that I was just like so much more drawn to than season seven of Supernatural, <laughs> you know, like my love for the show just really wasn't enough to keep me interested. And I got scared because I was like, well, I don't want that to bleed over like to our listeners, you know? And so it's like, cause it's, it's really awful to listen to somebody who just does not, not want to be talking about what they're talking about. People can really feel it. So I really shifted my focus to like, okay, I get to spend an hour talking to Drew about the show. Like I started really focusing on our relationship to get me back into recording and it, and it worked, I think like, because we had some of our best moments this season with, with <laughs> our silly dick jokes in part, you know, <laughs> and like, I don't know. I just like, we did such cool stuff this season. Like we hosted a hugely ambitious live stream fundraiser where we baked live uh, on the internet, which 
kind of like unhinged to think back to. And like, thanks to the generous people around us, we also managed to raise $500 for the archives, like Canada Square Archives. So like, I think overall this season, for me anyway, was a reminder really to focus on the process, not just on the content, which I think is one that I needed. It was a reminder I needed. Speaking of reminders, I have not forgotten. I owe uh, our listeners something to do with uh, my loss of that baking competition. I have said, I've not said out loud, but I have decided it's something that's going to be more between season seven and eight while we have that kind of uh, downtime to put mm-hmm. something out uh, right. to avoid stealing thunder from anything or anyone else. Hmm. But yeah, season seven was interesting. Uh, I knew going in, especially on the back of season six, that it was not a well-loved season. And it it felt like it took some reflection and retrospective to really see it as not that great. But I think going into it kind of expecting the worst led me to being a bit more surprised by the bits that I did like. Like, while I agree this sentiment that the season or the pair of seasons does try to kind of reinvent the entire backbone of the show and then go on to spend a chunk of time undoing the damage it did, I'm surprised I still got it still got back to a pretty good place by the end and we got like a villain i liked but i would have maybe liked to see more of and leviathan's felt almost like an afterthought they could have probably been a little bit better and not just crammed at the end of season seven all right um you know during the season i also managed to binge watch some other shows and i can truly see how doing this podcast and my limited background in film studies has begun to invade my everyday viewing of other shows uh, during this time, I also finally watched all of our Flag Means Death uh, and the associated Watch Along podcast at Gentleman's Pirates Library. Uh, I've also, like you, picked up the X Files uh, along with its uh, equivalent uh, Watch Along podcast, Non Human Biologics. And I'm realizing just how much I enjoy analyzing media, even when it's not for anyone to hear, except for, you know, maybe when I'm a little high at two in the morning and I text you about an episode of the X Files. Um, <laughs> So I think this season really just acted as a good reminder of how much I love what we do and how much I want to do more of it. Heck, I even officially joined a second podcast part-time. And recently an episode of me being interviewed was released. I just shared it in the the Discord. But uh, I really, I think this, I think this season, despite all of its lows, was the kick in the pants I needed to see the greater benefit of podcasting, of doing this, of having community and reaching out to new people and connecting with people. So I guess thanks season seven for being so bad that I had to find other (laughs) benefits. I mean, I just, what I'm hearing from both of our, 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 our look backs, I guess, at, at season seven is that we found community and relationships through season seven, which I think is also what begins to happen at the very end of season seven. So it, it feels very apropos. Look at that. I love that. Oh, see? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so as we did last season, we'll be looking at the season as a whole through the theme of family. More specifically, how the meaning of family for Sam and Dean has evolved throughout the season. And every season so far, like we've looked at different aspects of family, depending on like what the episodes in the season were showing us. And I was listening back to all of our story times from season seven. And I really noticed that this season seems to kind of ask the question, how do we deal with change in family relationships? And in this season, change takes the form of loss. Uh, For example, the death of Cass and Bobby. Uh, It also takes the form of betrayal, like Cass becoming God's Tiel, uh, Dean killing Amy, Ghost Bobby going dark side. But it also takes the form of expansion, like meeting Garth, Kevin, Charlie, and giving Jody a more recurring role. So yeah, like... What do we what do we do in those big moments of change within family? Or I guess more importantly, in this case, how do the characters in this story deal with those big changes? I think it's a large a, a large swath of area to explore. Yeah, um, for sure. And I want to make sure we use our time well. So would you like yeah. to start us off with Sam? Thank you. I will. Um, so I think that Sam and Dean go through 
big changes when it comes to family and they do that together. I'm thinking mostly about losing Bobby. They lose him twice and losing Cass and then getting him back. But one thing that is really specific to Sam is that he has to deal with the fact that Dean killed Amy, his childhood friend, and that he hid that fact from him. And we've seen Sam and Dean go through some extremely difficult times together in previous seasons. Um, but this was really the first time that like Sam had to, if not forgive, then at least like learn to move on from a really horrible and shitty thing that Dean did. And unfortunately, I find that it's not really earned in the narrative. And so it falls flat for me anyway. But I think that there was something there in terms of teaching us maybe like the limits or the boundaries of love and to really ask ourselves where those boundaries are for us. And for Sam, he was able to, again, if not forgive, then at least move on from Dean's actions and still find love in his heart for his brother, like regardless of whether or not we personally agree with him, Sam or Dean really in this case. So I knew we'd be coming back to this today mm -hmm. and I'm still blown away by how poorly this entire situation is handled. Like I kind of just take the hint from the show and put it behind me so I can move past it like Sam does for Dean. But it just feels so toxic that there was never any true closure or forgiveness of any kind. And yeah, I get it. The show does not have the emotional power or bandwidth to do this justice, let alone in a single episode, let alone a season. I guess what I'm getting at here is that if we are taking this entire plot point at face value and letting the story flow as it's written, then Sam clearly has such issues with how he connects to family that something like this can be so... I won't say easily glossed over, but like pretty glossed over and seemingly moved past, which lets us always go back to our favorite pastime of blaming John. You know, clearly this level of toxic family teachings has had a clear effect on both of them. Oh, for sure. I think that you're absolutely right when it comes to that. Like, I mean, the reality is that both Sam and Dean would have had to learn to get past some really shitty things that John has done to them and around them. And so this would just be like Sam digging into his childhood toolbox and being like, all right, this, is, I just need to, I just need to move past it because he's not going to say he's sorry. He's not going to like, and nothing can mm -hmm. fix it. Right. The person is gone. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Another thing that I do want to mention when it comes to Sam is his like Lucifer in his head situation as a metaphor for mental illness or even illness or disability in general, because I, I just think that there again was so much potential there. Um, part of my academic work has to do with the intersection of like age, gender, and disability looking particularly at the experiences of disabled girls. And one thing that I always like to ask research participants during an interview is like if they feel like they're being treated differently than their peers or their siblings. So whether it's at school or in the home, do you feel like people treat you differently from the people around you? And often that answer is yes. And like whether that's because they're disabled or because they're girls or because they're young or both, like they'll usually tell me a little bit more about that. And when I was watching this season, I basically saw that happening with Sam. Like I saw the people around him start to treat him differently when he started showing signs of mental illness. And I guess I just want to hold some space here for the folks who can relate to that because in true supernatural fashion, there's also no satisfying resolution for that. Like Cass just takes on Sam's Lucifer hallucinations and Sam is magically better. But in real life, like this could have been a major adjustment for Sam and for his loved ones, right? Yeah, I, I think I predicted at some point that Sam would have a tough time getting back to his old self once he was Lucifer free. But it sort of got better. Like, and now we're so far removed from it. Heck, Cass even seems to have moved past that specific part of the whole thing. Again, he's suffering in other ways and has his own issues, but seeing Lucifer isn't among them. Uh, and I agree with what you said. It felt like they were taking a decent supernatural themed approach to dealing with a real world issue without tackling it directly, in this case, mental illness. 
and like weaving it into the character, adding a new dimension to Sam. But like in an attempt, I guess, to kind of work towards this giant undo button of the last two seasons, it's just dropped. And this could have been a huge character development point for Sam. And I feel like that was the intent, but instead it just got shelved. I mean, yeah, I think like whatever ended up happening behind the scenes, like it just, yeah, it, it never got followed through. And that's truly like a symptom of so many things that happen on Supernatural, unfortunately. Yeah, I really think it could have been a great evolution to Sam, seeing how he deals with it, how people around him deal with it. Even in the post-Lucifer time that we get at the end of season mm -hmm. seven, having you know his trust be an issue or having him still question things or still be concerned in ways that would require other people to you know connect with him in different ways and it just mm -hmm. sort of like I was hopeful and then it wasn't yeah I think that the biggest change that I see in Sam this season is that he's once again beginning beginning to lean on shows and family now as we know the last time that he really leaned on shows and family was through ruby and it really backfired on him so it's incredibly brave for him i think to open himself up again to jody to garth to kevin to charlie to various degrees of course and and we know that it's not that easy and we know that he doesn't always want to, but he does. And especially now that he's left at the very end of the season without his usual close or tight knit family, um, he's going to have to lean on chosen family a lot, if a lot more anyway, if he wants to survive the next little bit. Right. So we know that Sam has a tendency of going like hyper-focused, like serial killer mode when Dean's not around, like we saw in the trickster episode a few seasons ago. So how does he manage to stay grounded and connected next season without Dean? Like, how is he going to deal with all of this loss? And I guess we're going to find out. Because clearly you know the answer. I, I know the answer. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> so I'm going to stop being a negative jerk for a little bit because I feel like I've been very negative up till now in this story time. Um, but Sam this season did a like really good like this season really was a good job of widening sam's found family and i'm very excited to see how he leverages having others in his life that he can like to some degree trust and reach out to in a time of aloneness like i'm bummed the connection i want to see most is like again i've always thought i think a sam and cast buddy cop episode would be so good that's true uh but it given that he amazing. is one of the people he's lost it's not gonna happen um but like I, I did, I predicted that he's going to uh, first person he's going to try to reach out to is Jody. Uh, and I hope now more than anything that we get a Sam and Garth crossover somehow in this. But I think the more likely one is a Sam and Kevin connection. And I think because we've already discussed how there are so many similarities in Kevin and Sam, I think the two of them together would be one, a lot of room for both of them to grow and for Kevin to become a more fleshed out character. And for Sam to kind of get to be the older brother role for once and with someone who was like on equal footing to him in the knowledge area. Um, and I think just the two of them would be really funny, if not really wholesome. I am just so excited for you to watch episode one of season eight. <laughs> I mean, just in theory, so I can watch after this, so. Oh, you are? You're going to watch it I mean, after I this? could. I have no reason not to. Oh, well, anyway, it'll be fun. Um... Do we have anything else to add about Sam? I mean, I feel like he was underutilized. Like, I feel like in writing my notes for this and reflecting on the season, he felt more like a plot point than a character, which is why I had so much trouble writing about him and talking about him. Because okay. I feel like where there was room for him to grow, the, again, to break out of story time for half a second, the outer limits of the show's production required him to be the dropped point to further things like cast and bringing back the things they had to bring back and undoing the things they had done. And I feel like Sam suffers more than Cass in that regard, as far as the writing goes. And I think that's always sort of been the issue, but overall, like when we did get Sam's highlights, like little moments that stick out to me, um, even just that moment when they're in the the, the the grocery the the gas station and he has to explain to Dean that like 
you know, you know, uh, all natural doesn't mean it doesn't have like preservatives and shit in it. And then yeah. it's just as risky, like those little moments or like seeing him in that same episode kind of freak out about like taking the blood from the, the stoner dude on the bench. Yeah. Like we did get little bubbly moments of Sam where like we really got to dig into because he is such a deep character. This season just didn't give him as much room to be explored as I would have liked. It's so funny because for me, Dean was the character that I found the hardest to write about this week. Not really. Sam. Yeah. And, and I don't, I, I honestly didn't think that it would be the case, but here we are. Um, I, and I think that part of that is because of how much of Dean's storyline is intertwined with grief and loss, because I really do think that Dean is the one who takes both Bobby and Cass's death the hardest. Um, and I think that it has to do with something that you mentioned, Drew, in one of our episodes where you said that even though Bobby's death is a loss for both Sam and Dean, Sam still has Dean as a parent-like figure to lean mm -hmm. on, whereas, like, Dean has no one left. And in terms of Cass, obviously, like, we know that Dean and Cass have a more profound bond, to quote Cass in season six. So it makes sense that he would take that loss a lot harder than Sam. And that loss is really what pushes him to make some really bad decisions in the season, like killing Amy, for example. Yeah. Like looking at the theme of family, as we do each season, this one does seem to jump out at me the most. And it's Dean's relationship with Bobby, but mostly how he handles Bobby's passing. Uh, I think I took it for granted that I always assumed Bobby made it to the end of the series. Like I legit never expected his death to even come up like him getting shot. To me, if I had to put it in the show, I would have guessed it would have been like an end of season 15 before the finale. Mm. So I can only imagine if I, a viewer who knows this show, is out to hurt me constantly and I didn't see this coming, that I can like connect with Dean in that way. Like the Dean must have, how he must have felt. But like, you know, I said it before, Dean only ever really had Bobby as a stable person to fall back on for anything. And like, sure, he has other people who he can trust, but never in the same way that Bobby was like as a parental figure. You know, he's like Dean himself is that person for Sam, but Bobby was that person for Dean. And now there is no one there to replace. him. And to be clear, like those aren't even close to the only losses that Dean goes through this season, because like, yeah, like we've talked about, ad nauseum frankly this season he loses Cass he loses Bobby he loses Bobby twice uh but he also loses his car he loses his comfort his favorite food his rock aliases he loses his daughter which is pretty unhinged like to put last but again <laughs> here we are I guess thanks Buck Lemming um and I, I I just think that Dean's main challenge this season is to treat himself and Sam also to a certain degree with like love and compassion in the middle of all of this grief and all of this loss. And I think that the way that he manages to do that, or I think, I think I should more say like tries to do that is first by like self-medicating with alcohol. Uh, we do see him drinking a lot more than usual this season, which makes sense considering that he uses drinking as a coping mechanism and he's got a lot of coping to do. And the second way that he does that, that he, like tries to treat himself kindly is by allowing his circle of care or like his family to expand. So first he helps Chrissy in adventures in babysitting. And then he develops a relationship with Garth, with Charlie, with Kevin. And it just like expands his family in a way that makes it easier for him to have that help that he needs. I mean, we can all say it, Bobby, ha uh, Bobby, I, Ruined my own punchline. Dean had one true role model, and it was Bobby. Yeah. And I think Dean is becoming more like Bobby this season. I think he's starting to become the old reliable type, the always ready to answer a call and do the right thing. You know, I don't mean to imply that Dean wasn't a go-to person and heroic, but there's something about his actions recently with those you mentioned when it feels less of like, I guess I have to, and more of a, this is me now. And I think in a subtle way, this is Dean picking up the mantle from Bobby as like the go-to resource and leads me to believe that assuming Dean survives this show, because I still don't know anything about the ending, that 
the like postscript of Supernatural is Dean sitting in an old cabin with a line of labeled phones on the wall as the man in the chair for a new generation of hunters, including Charlie and Kevin. I don't know how to sidestep that one. So I'm just going <laughs> to continue with what I have in my notes. Um, but yeah, I think honestly, like when I do think about it, I think that this is, this, this would be, this would be great. I would love that. I hope that that's what happens, Drew. I really do. Oh, um, I'm sure it's not. It's going to be way more upsetting than this. I've painted a positive, <laughs> a positive, a positive image. Supernatural won't allow me to have that. Oh my lord! <laughs> the, the the postscript will be Dean lying in a bed, dropping a snow globe in black and white, yelling "Rosebud" or "Baby." Oh goodness! <laughs> Carry on, please. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what to do about this. But okay, so let's let's change topics for a second because I also want to talk about Dean and Cass resolving or at least taking steps to resolve like the conflict that's happening in their relationship because that was just not an easy one, right? Like we talked about that, um, about how they're just not on the same page since season six and they just like, they didn't need the same thing in season seven. Like once they actually got back, got back together let's put it that way and like if nothing else um they do remain connected or at least like committed to finding a resolution in this case and in this conversation about change that we're having change in family i i really hope that i can stress like how much I admire that of the both of them, because I think that that would have been really easy for them to just be like, you know what, this is just not working for me and I'm going to step aside. Like I want out of this relationship. Um, and it would have been easy for both of them to, to do that or either of them, but neither of them does that. They both really stay loyal to each other in a moment of great change, of great turmoil for better or worse, one might say. And I just think that that's really, really beautiful. And like I said in the last episode, uh, now that they're in purgatory together, they're going to need to stick together because it would be pretty hard for Dean's family to expand when he's surrounded by monsters. I feel like you're setting something up there. I'm just saying it. <laughs> no, to act as a counterpoint to the Sam Dean relationship this season, just sort of being for the most part neutral, despite so much up and down. Uh, and again, there are some like very small moments of like really shining moments, like the end of um, the clown episode. I refuse to remember the title of. <laughs> Penny <P> <laughs> <laughs> What, what, did I, calls magic si menagerie. <laughs> what did I call it? Silly Putty's house of Silly Putty? Yes, there you go. that's what you call it. And I'm like, that's not what it is. <laughs> Anyways, Dean and Cass really do see a true, proper, emotional amount of growth and understanding. We see how hard Cass tries to not interact regarding his mistakes and just move on in a very Dean-like fashion. But Dean, who has grown, knows that won't work and tries to get through to Cass. And like, sure, they may falter at times and be a bit harsh, but like, that's how emotions are sometimes. They kind of just blow up a little bit. And I know it's not news that these two are clearly in a romantic relationship, but this season, after they are reunited, we really see what it's like for two people who love each other to try and get through something and learn how to properly communicate with one another. And I'm not even saying it's perfect or they reach the pinnacle of communication but they adapted to each other and they worked together to understand as much as they could. And like, I genuinely feel like, again, not a huge bar to pass where they started when they reconnected this season at like what he cast first gets his memory back and then takes the Lucifer thing versus where they end despite being in purgatory. They're a better place emotionally, if not physically, clearly. Right. Speaking of Cass. <laughs> Speaking of Cass, there you go. Um, he's not in a lot of this season, but he definitely makes a strong impression when he is on screen, right? Like, I think that Cass's biggest challenge when it comes to family this season is coming back to family after having done something really, really bad. So, like, we know that Cass became, like, God Stiel in the end of season six. And even though he did nothing wrong, because he is the Cass of my life and he is just a baby... Just a baby. It's just a baby. 
he still killed a lot of angels he betrayed a lot of people and he did bring the leviathan out of purgatory so you know like just being honest about that a little mistake just little tiny mistakes just like little errors in judgment um and after being brought back somehow like he has to face all of that which let's be honest like is a big deal to be facing on your own especially when you don't have like any kind of like human or 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 emotions or tools to be able to deal with any of this right um and we can see that he has two families that are welcome him welcoming him back in very different ways you've got the angels who are like wanting to forcibly take him back to heaven and like tell him that he has fallen in every way imaginable. And then you've got the Winchesters who like, even though they're not warm and fuzzy from the get go, like they understand that people fuck up and that their love for him is greater than like their desire for him to act a certain way. Right. Like then they, their goal is not to make Cass comply. It's just to have a relationship with Cass. And that's, I think, really well encapsulated in Dean's like, I'd rather have you cursed or not. Like, that's love, right? Mm -hmm. oh. That truly is. Like, that is such a magical line. I'm so like, uh, it stuck with me. And like, one, can I just say, I'm glad I can stop pretending he wasn't coming back. Like, <laughs> yeah. anyway, it's interesting how it feels like there's two sides to Cass's family life and the way that he's treated so differently yet he appeals to each side with like a very different side of himself. So I, that's a lot of weird, I, I had trouble wording this. So like, hopefully this makes sense, but like the angels who see him as fallen and then he must be taken away and rehabilitated, I guess is kind of the vibe. Cass tries to use what he's done as a shield from having to rejoin them and get out of being one of them. Hmm. And with the Winchesters who want him back and in the family and work towards forgiveness, he tries to not bring it up and move on. Like, he, like if he just changed his approach to both sides of the family, like, it would have worked better almost. But he, like, swung too far the wrong way on both of them. That sounds like Cass, actually. <laughs> Which is also the most Cass thing I can oh, imagine. Like that's just a very Cass thing to do. Drew, I'm very sorry to say this, but we are going to talk about Bobby one last time on this show. Uh, in the recap, at least. Uh, and I think that there's a lot that we could go into when it comes to Bobby and family and change. Um, but a lot of that we've talked about, especially in the last few episodes. So it's still pretty fresh. And I just don't want to be repeating the same thing over and over. But there is one thing that I want to bring up here. And it's that it's never too late to change your relationship to family members. And like, you can get closure, even if you're no longer talking to the person that you need closure from, or even if like that person has since then passed. Um, I think that we see that so very clearly in Death's Door. Like Bobby's dad has been dead for decades and Bobby still manages to change that relationship with his father. Because the thing is like, Bobby might not have like have a relationship with his father anymore in the sense that like his father is dead. And so the relationship is over in that sense. But that relationship and its effects still live inside of Bobby right? Like he doesn't want to have kids because he remembers how his father was with him. And I think that that's um, something that we can all relate to, or most of us can relate to in some way where like relationships that are over still live inside of us. And I guess I just admire Bobby's courage and his bravery for like voicing that the effects of that relationship, like do not suit him anymore and frankly have never suited him. And it's just like such a powerful moment of pattern and cycle breaking. And like, I don't know, like this show can give us this and then it gives us like Emma, you know? And I, I like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. It's just so like the, anyway, yeah, there you go. I need to stop. I, I'm going to start ranting. I, <laughs> I love Sorry. when you rant. I know we're on a timer, unfortunately, for once, so. Uh, otherwise, I'd be egging you on. Um, <sighs> but yeah, I think Bobby's final I, I, living non-ghost moments, mm -hmm. living moments. I don't know where, where you classify not dead, but not ghost Bobby. We need a word for I that. <laughs> it, limbo Bobby? Anyways, um, Bobby's last moments in Death's Door, really like that entire finale of him confronting his father and you know, getting the closure I, I think there's even a level of like reconnecting like just with himself 
and like looking at himself through a new lens in all of this. You know, like I feel like we said it before, but closure comes from within. And sure, external forces may help, but ultimately, even if you forg- even if you're forgiven, it's up to you to accept it. So, like as you said, even though he can only confront his father in his memories, he can still grow and learn from those memories and by reevaluating his feelings about it. And while we have lost Bobby, it's not to say that we've lost his memory, and he will forever, even if not said out loud be a part of the boys and their family forever. And I think that is only for the better. I, you know, there's something that you said about how doing this, confronting his father in his memory is something that changes the way Bobby sees himself. And I just, I, I, I need to say that. Yes, absolutely. That is a thing where when we look back on our past, we are able to understand things differently with the context that we have today, right? And to see in context that those things either maybe shouldn't have happened or were really, really good things, or just we understand them in a way that is way different than we did when we were in the moment. And by doing that, we understand ourselves differently and we project also different things because when we understand ourselves differently, we story ourselves differently for ourselves and for others. And so yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, it like it's almost like looking back on things through a different lens or with the guidance of a professional is something beneficial that more people should be doing. Like there should be a paid profession where you pay someone who studied all this and helps you look back at these moments and learn and grow from them and reevaluate them with a new outlook on life as you've grown and you've matured and you've been more emotionally well and educated. Yeah, wouldn't that be a th- a great thing to have one day? Would be fantastic. Uh, I just want to mention that somebody in the chat said that Limbo Bobby should be called Limbobby. Yes, I'm, I've already <laughs> I, I saw it. I already made a note of like that's a thing. I'm keeping that. I don't know when I'll ever get to use it again, but I'm keeping it. Oh my god! Kat, All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Cat, for this amazing portmanteau. I love it. So. Last season recap, we did this thing and we really, really liked it. We had so much fun doing it and we decided to do it again. So Drew and I (laughs) each have prepared our personal top 10 for season seven. And this time we're going to be doing top 10 favorite favorite lines from season seven. Uh, So of course, we don't know what the other wrote down. So we're going to be discovering it along with you. Um, let me actually pull that up because I was not ready to, to... I have mine pulled up with, uh, I, I have, I, so I, I can ramble a bit while you get yourself ready. So okay. I've got who said it, the episode they said it in, uh, and my lines, I have them ranked from least to most impactful. From 10 to um, one. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's a top 10. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. The, the way, the way you would do it. I'm just looking to fill time and explain. Thank you. All right. So how about you get us started with your number 10 and then I'll give you my number 10 and then we'll go. Exactly. Right. I'm also curious to see how many we, someone keep track or count. I wonder how many we match on. Yeah. Uh, so my number 10 is for episode 21 with Kevin. This looks like a sex torture dungeon. Is this a sex torture dungeon? <laughs> I can't believe you know you wrote that down. I love it. I love such it. A, it's such a good line. I don't know why. It just, it, it tells us everything we need to know about Kevin so quickly. Listen, I'm going to be real honest with you all. Like, so many of mine are from 721 reading is fundamental. So, same, like, same. Just saying, like just, so what's your number 10? Amazing. So My number, number 10, 10 from 721, I watch the bees. <laughs> I I had that on my list too, but I had to cut some 721 ones. I realized uh, I, I am. Do I have no cast lines on here? What? What? Oh, shit. I have some good ones though, but I'm really bummed about that. That's insane. Mm-mm. Um. Well, my next one is from Sam in 721. Megatron, you're saying a Transformer wrote that? <laughs> I love that one. I love that one. I love that whole exchange so much, to be honest with you. I, I was trying to find the exact line, but I think it's Sam's like, like I think I said in the episode, it's Sam's combination of knowing it's a Transformer, but then be confused when yes. he tries to correct him. Yes, absolutely. So my number nine is from 721 as well. And it's a Kevin line when he goes, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Because I, I usually say that 
whenever I don't know what's going on, I'm like, what is happening? And it's always the gif of Kevin that comes to mind. I'm like, what I, love is all the, I love all the all, all the craziness going on in the chat here, by the way, people being upset that I don't have a cast line. And like, I didn't even realize until I was looking at the list that I like, every time I had to like narrow down, I can't believe it. I, I don't, I have very few overlap in other characters though. Interesting. Um, so my next one is a Bobby line from 720. Ooh. Okay, let's Yoda this. And I just think, like, from the comedy aspect, but also just he's a ghost, like, using his powers, but also he was always the Yoda figure. It, like, it works on so many levels. I had to. I love it. My number eight is Peace Out, Bitches, from 720. Because <laughs> I just love that line, because it means that Charlie's going to be in it. Or was in it, and I love it. So that. my next two are from Charlie. <laughs> oh, yay! Uh, so number seven is, your password is winning with two ones. Fail. And just, as an IT person, the pain this puts me in is physical. Uh, oh. Please don't send me back to that time in my life where all I did for months and months and months was reset Apple ID passwords. Oh, I, just, I don't want to go back to that. I still do it with my family. Oh, I, I'm like, I don't know. They've changed stuff so much since I was there. <laughs> just like, I don't remember how it works. Also valid. <laughs> What's your number seven? That was my seven. What's your seven? Oh, my seven. Sorry. It's, <laughs> um, it's Cass in Meet the New Boss, 701. I am utterly indifferent to sexual orientation. Yes. Oh, I can't oh, believe like, it. That's right. <laughs> I oh, I think I think I'm realizing now that like the like going through, I kind of started at the end, it worked backwards with memory. And I think just how long ago that was, I forgot about it. But mm. yes, that is well, yes, it's a god steel line. It is like one of the most powerful it's lines. It's a really good one. Uh, uh my next one, number six, yeah. is also a Charlie from 720. Mm -hmm. And it's just in response to Dean, as in he's not a girl. As in he's not a girl. Queer representation. Yeah your representation love lesbians yes. um my number, number six, six is actually it's a it's an exchange right oh okay yes metatron the transformer that's megatron what oh <laughs> uh, i have and a megatron on my shelf what? right there too <laughs> yes I that exchange it. is like like i i i I didn't think to do the whole exchange, but I wanted to. So I'm counting right. that as one crossover line. All right, right, right. <laughs> uh, my next one comes from one of the other bestest boys this season. And it's, you've just been Garthed. Oh, Garth. Oh, we love Garth. We do. Uh, my number five is, are you going to look at some more anime or are you strictly into dick now from 712 <laughs> time after time? It's not my next one, but I have the other the other variant of that same line for my number three. <laughs> uh, uh, my next one actually is the campiest line of the entire season from mm -hmm. 722. Ooh. See you next season. Oh, yes. <laughs> what a good choice. Oh, my God. And like Very legit, good. like I'm excited for the Alpha Vamp to come back. Like, I really hope he is the big bad for next season. Like, I love him. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah um my number four is i'll go with you because because uh from yeah. 721 Cass says that to dean i'll go with you um my number three is a bit of a long one but it's from sam and i just like I, again i have sam on this list twice i know Cass. i really fucked up i know but this one to me was like i couldn't not put it on for the same reason you put it on your list i can't believe i'm about to say this but I hope you're watching Cartoon Smut because reading Dick Roman crap over and over again is just self-punishment. <laughs> yeah. Just 712 um, with the 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 head, the head die shit. I I know there's a lot of uh there's time after time was a very gay episode. <laughs> uh my number three is I'd rather have you cursed or not, again from 721. Because mm. again, that's love. That is also a really good one. Um Number two comes from someone who I know isn't dead yet. <laughs> no, Cupcake. What I did when I was 25 and came home to find my wife and two kids gutted on the oh. floor decided to be fine. Till the end of the week, make yourself smile because you're alive and that's your job. Then do it again the next week. I call it being professional. I don't know why that line stuck with me so hard throughout the series. Mm. But as Frank's like final lesson to Dean, I felt like it stuck to something. 
I think we'll see that actually in future seasons. So we'll keep that in mind. When Frank comes back, got it. Right, right. Um, My number two is Bobby saying, I was a kid in Death's Door. Oh, that's it. My number one is also from Bobby and also from Death's Door. Glad I saved the best for last. Oh. That that to me was just that was the ultimate sign off for Bobby. Like I know he came back as a ghost, but like that to me was Bobby's final goodbye to them. Really, yeah, that was really beautiful. And your number one, my number one is a line that again hits home for me. Uh, the very touch of you corrupts when Castiel first laid a hand on you in hell. He was lost. Seven twenty one. Hmm. Oh, well, this was cry. so fun. <laughs> it was. was so fun. I, I knew it was going to be like the funny lines up top and then like the really emotional, heartbreaking moments of the end. Oh my God. Let's never do this again. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> or we set the theme of our favorite comedic lines or our favorite exchanges or references. We, we, we did an upbeat theme for them. <laughs> we have bummed everybody out in the chat, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we move on to reflections and calls to action, mine's a positive one. Okay, well, do you want to get us started then? Yes. This season, while this season, again, had its downs, it was not beloved. I I mostly enjoyed it for the more analytical side versus story side of things. The thing the story did do and really started towards the end, and it's the one thing I think that it has going for it into season eight, is family and specifically new family. Like we've said, I think giving Jody a bigger part in this, uh, Charlie, who I understand is coming back and I know is coming back, Kevin, who I know is coming back in, Cass being reunited with Dean and Sam having to reconnect all these threads and build this family again. Heck, even Meg to some small extent at the end of all this, new family and finding your people is so important. And that is what I have been doing this last year and a bit since moving is really been a year of finding my new clan, group, family, friends, loved ones, and people. Mm -hmm. And it's looking at, you know, how much of an outsider you can be and how like you can be so separated from people around you for so many reasons, but there's always ways to break through and find those connections. Mm -hmm. And whether they are miles away in other states and provinces and you only can't go for podcasting, or they're people I speak to on Discord regularly and rant about trying to make a plushie or playing video games or talking about this show that my clan is out there and I found you and you found us and we found each other. Thank you for sharing that. That's really lovely. And Mary, I imagine you must have a call to action, some reflections from this season. Oof. Well, you know, I'm going to bum everybody out again. Damn it. Um, <laughs> should have gone last. We should've, I should have started. <laughs> Sorry. But the whole time that I was taking my notes, like I had like a very specific song stuck in my head because like the theme of change within family, like vividly reminds me of Fleetwood Mac's uh, landslide. Um, You know, I've been afraid of changing because I built my life around you. This is just such a profoundly important song for me that really kind of like concentrates the essence of this theme. And we know that change can be really hard, right? Like, especially within family relationships, because they're like, so based on patterns of behavior. And to change that and to change those relationships requires a break in those patterns, like a break in those cycles. And so I'm feeling called to honor the challenge of change. And to acknowledge how hard it is to change and to celebrate it when I see it in myself and in others. That wasn't a bummer at all. I love that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Change like, change can be scary, but it's a good thing. Well, I mean, it depends, right? But like, it can be very positive. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So we went a little bit over time with our story time, but is there anything that maybe the folks who are here with us recording, do you guys have any questions or comments that you'd like us to respond to? Would you like to prompt us? I did see somebody complaining that the line, Mr. Fizzles thinks you're a liar, should have been on somebody's list. Thanks, <laughs> Nell. 
Uh, I correct. think I think it was on my long, long list. And also, like, I realize I'm going to say this now and I'm going to get yelled at. I had no Dean lines either. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. You know what? I Listen, I took care of all of the cast, Dean, and Destiel <laughs> lines. But that's also why I I thought about that line, the Mr. Fizzles thinks you're a liar. And I was like, oh, Drew's definitely going to pick that one. So I'm not going to touch it. Uh, I, went for, I, went for the, I went for the, you went Garth. If I was going to get one Garth line in there, it had to be his catchphrase. Fair enough. You so I've unironically said it out loud at least twice outside of this podcast. <laughs> I love you so much. Oh, so does anybody have anything? Because otherwise, like, or Rochelle, is there anything that stands out for you that you'd like to have us respond to? We can definitely do that. Oh, my goodness. This was such an emotional recap. I wasn't expecting that. You, you know what? Like, I, 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 I we've said it before <laughs> with episodes where, like, episodes themselves that are not particularly strong lead us to, like, more powerful conversation because of it. That's true. So a season that had a lot of room to let us flex our, our thinking muscles, mm. I think allowed for us to bear more emotion and read more into it because we had to do more of the heavy lifting than the show wasn't doing. That's right. That's right. Oh, you want to know his predictions for season eight. So we're going to have us uh, like we have something planned for that already. Um, we're not going to share them here, but he has already said that he thinks that Sam is going to go see Jody, right? That's what you said? Yeah, I, I think that's the one I can let slip right now that we've already said a lot on the show. It'll be in the mm-hmm. recordings I said it today. Um, I think Sam's first, like, what do I do now that I'm alone is going to be turning to Jody. Um, and then I won't go into much more from there uh, because I think my the next big the next big question is how long is it going to be a separation of Sam and Dean? Part of me wants it to be longer. I foresee it not being very long because the way the show formats. But I would love to see Sam maybe partner up with Kevin for an episode or something and get like a solo episode with Kevin. And then Dean returns and there's kind of the like, Sam gets a relationship with Kevin outside of just the one with the two of them and Kevin. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, to to respond to Lisa's comment about loving season about loving this show and season seven highlighting the reasons we can love the show, I think that it says something that we were able to go through. And yes, I think for you and I, Mary, the advantages were kind of tied into recording and releasing this on a regular basis. That we only have the option to stop have commitments. We, yeah, we, we've basically <laughs> committed to this. Like we could stop, but we're not going to. No. Um, and knowing that we got through season seven, nothing can stop us now. Well, um, we're, no, absolutely not. And and it means that like we we've gone over most of it now. Yeah. So we're we're, like, we're, 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 we're more than halfway done. So this, this was the Wednesday of the series. Yeah, this was the Wednesday of the series. You're absolutely right. All right. Um so what have your highlight episodes been? Ooh, Drew, if there's one episode that like, or a couple of, of, uh, of episodes that kind of like stand out for you, what are they? Uh, from this season, the two that like really stuck with me the most three, actually, I think there's three that really hit me like the most that like, I'm going to look, look back on fondly, Charlie, Garth, clowns. Like I, I genuinely penny whistle. I make fun of the fact that I can't remember the name of it properly, but I think it was the the connection between Sam and Dean was the most genuine and adorable in the way that there was that like brotherly camaraderie of like kind of japping each other with like the clown thing still and being funny, Mm -hmm. like with the gift at the very end. But Sam Dean's ability to grow and understand a little bit about himself because of it and realize that what he did hurt Sam and that Sam was able to use it as a way to like understand his childhood trauma and fears. Mm -hmm. Like it was the most emotional growth they had in their relationship this season, in my opinion. And then the Garth and Charlie episode, just it's very easy that Garth is such a beloved character. And I really like the shoujo as a demon. So the combination of Garth being heroic, uh, being kind of the main character of the episode, like I almost wanted a more of a um, um, ghost facers where like it was from his perspective more than like a side character. But like yeah, that would have been cool. I, I'm still holding out for it, maybe. Uh, and then Charlie is just the character of the show. I've already claimed her as the Winchester sister. She might as well be the th- the fourth sibling 
I swear to God, I forgot about Adam completely. It's okay. So we bad. all do. We all do. It's fine. It's fine. Like, um, he's still in hell, right? Like he's still in the cage, right? Or do we know? He's do we ever cage. see him again? I don't know. Did anybody take him out of the cage? There you go. He's still I, there. Like, um, I'm, I'll be excited for him to come back, maybe? Yes. On my end, uh, just to kind of like close out that question, I... So one episode that I do look at very, very differently is Reading is Fundamental because like I always knew that it was an important episode, but I I guess I just didn't realize just how important it was until like we really dug into it and then like linked it back to the men who would be king. Um, so that that one definitely changed my perspective. And that's, I, I mean, I always I already loved Repo Man before. So that was just kind of like a pleasure to dive into that like really dark episode Mm -hmm. and I have to say that hear me out but season seven time for a wedding I think like the with the whole cinematography of like Sam being presented with red walls or red lighting behind him and that being a theme that's carried out through like all the way until he like cast takes on his lucifer burden i like it's something that i had never noticed on the show and i'd never really seen anybody talk about either and i was just like i can't believe that they did this really cool thing that like just very few people have noticed and i don't know like at first when i i I noticed it i was like this is weird like let's see where it leads and then in season seven time for a wedding like it was really crystallized for me that that's that was an intentional thing and i just thought that it was very very cool um yeah lisa adds like it really showed how all the crew of supernatural adds to the themes and i completely agree with that i thought that that was like just a really great um addition from the sets people because it was like done throughout Mm -hmm. the season regardless of who was directing or writing so props i also think that might have been my favorite episode to record that season too really i I, I feel like the conversations it sparked and like that we were able to kind of dive into these like different kind of like rabbit holes that other episodes didn't really touch on Mm -hmm. it just it just stood out so much from the rest of the show and the rest of the season in a way that it made for a very different flavor of recording, which I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. So um, Noel is noticing here or letting us know that Sam is represented by Red as early as Lazarus Rising. And I know that also like, um, there's something about like either Sam or Dean, like oh, anyway, like from behind the scenes, one is like red tape and one is blue tape for like the, like mm, the marking there uh, yes thank you spots, thank you yeah. oh my goodness words are hard at night um <clears throat> so it, it's very uh, honestly like if i can just take full responsibility like i just had never noticed it right and so i just thought that that was yeah maybe i should have noticed it so thank but you i love that. that it's something that we like we did eventually pick up on and like now mm. it's become something we like actively look for yeah. Uh, it, lighting in general is something that I feel like I, is overlooked. Even myself, someone who's like been like taught to look for it, I don't always look for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when it is especially evident in certain episodes, it's really nice. Right. All right. Well, um, we're gonna be closing out this recording session because we have been keeping you for over an hour. So. You've been listening to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Drew Schulman and myself, Marie Vigourou. Thank you to everyone supporting us on Coffee or Patreon, and an extra thank you to our bunker supporters, L, Jeremiah Thomas, and Simone. This week, we'd like to thank everyone who is here and attending this live recording. Thank you. You can find the links to all of our social media and our merch store at carryingwayward.com. And don't forget to leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to us. And if you like Carrying Wayward and you'd like to support us in our project to go through all 15 seasons of Supernatural, you can support us through Coffee or Patreon, and you can find those links at carryingwayward.com. We'll be taking a short two-week break, but don't worry, we've got some fun stuff planned for you during this time. And we'll be back on April 5th with Season 8, Episode 1. We need to talk about Kevin through the theme of responsibility. Carry on our wayward friends. Carry on, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>
I lost my tongue. I don't know where it went. Oh, Mr. Druzels. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Druzel needs a new tongue, it turns out. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out with us on a Monday. Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh, no. My mouth exploded. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This is my time. Ah. <laughs>